Hello, good morning, and good afternoon. Welcome to the IA webinar on critical minerals. I'm Taeyun Kim from the International Energy Agency. So today is the, the, the session, first session of the two-part webinar on critical minerals. So we, today, in part one, we will discuss the topic about the market outlook and also geopolitical implications and also the ways to scale up investment in for, for diversification. So we have some excellent line of panelists from industry, investment bank, and also development finance institutions. So we have four the great speakers. So first, we have this Mark Richard from Bio Tinto, the general manager for international affairs and strategy in battery materials from Bio Tinto. And second, we have uh, the Colin Hamilton, the managing director of the BMO Capital Market. And third, we will have the Michael Willoughby, global head of metals and mining in HSBC, and finally, we have Ekaterina Otep, the Senior Investment Officer in Metals Mining IFC. So before the moving on to panel discussion, then we will invite the Mr. Satoshi Katahira to give some opening remark. Because the, this event, this webinar is supported by the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. So he will give some, some opening remark to set the scene. So, Mr. Katahira, thanks for the supporting this webinar, and now the floor is yours. Hello, uh, good, uh, good evening, and uh, good, uh, good afternoon, or good morning. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe there, there are some time differences, but uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Satoshi Katahira, Director General of Economic Affairs Bureau of uh, MoFA, Japan. And I'm very glad to uh, be here uh, to make a uh, short uh, remarks uh, uh, at the occasion of the uh, the uh, important you know uh, uh, webinar uh, held today. Yeah, uh, as countries uh, accelerate their uh, decarbonization effort, uh, there is growing international interest in critical minerals that are essential to the uh, clean energy transition. Against this backdrop, uh, I, the IAEA's holding the, of uh, critical minerals and the Clean Energy Summit this September is very timely. We appreciate the IAEA's contribution in this uh, field. The summit was deemed a, a meaningful opportunity for various factors, including resource-rich countries, the private sector, and civil society, to discuss and deepen uh, cooperation to uh, in, ensure a sustainable and uh, responsible supply chain. This webinar is uh, the first of two events to be held under Japanese uh, government's voluntary contribution and is being implemented through the efforts of the IEA, IEA uh, Secretariat. We look forward to a lively discussion with the speakers based on the key takeaway from the recent uh, summit which focus on accelerating uh, progress toward uh, diversified uh, mineral supplies. As countries move forward, uh, decarbonization, uh, demand for critical minerals such as cobalt, nickel, and rare earths, which are key raw materials for renewable energy equipment such as batteries and window tubing, is expected to increase sharply in the future. Tight in, uh, supply demand condition and disrupt, uh, disruptions in the st uh, stable supply of key minerals in the future could be an um, obstacle to a smooth energy transition. From this uh, perspective, it is necessary to address geopolitical risks in uh, the supply of critical minerals, such as geographical unevenness of uh, results and uh, uh, oligopoly of uh, refining and processing uh, processes by certain countries, and to diversify and strengthen the supply chain through responsible and sustainable development. 
adhere to high ESG standards is the first step toward sustainable development in rich, uh, research, uh, re resource rich countries. Strengthening the government's capacity of uh, resource rich countries and ensuring that uh, development meet high ESG standards that take into account the human rights of workers and the surrounding environment will ensure the interests of local people and lead to sustainable development and increased supply. In this regard, we welcome the fact that the IEA Critical Mineral Working Party, CMWP, is preparing policy recommendations to clarify rules and principles related to ESG uh, criteria. I hope that the IEA will continue to promote the necessary rulemaking. In order to implement new projects that meet high ESG standards, it is necessary to deepen uh, collaboration and dialogue with consuming countries, resource-rich countries, and private companies and investors. In this regard, Japan, in cooperation with the United States and 13 other countries, is supporting compliance with ESG standards in resource-rich countries through the Mineral Security Partnership, uh, MSC, uh, MSP, and is promoting efforts to attract a wide range of investment. In order to diversify supply, support for the refining and uh, processing sectors in resource-rich countries is necessary. In this regard, Japan has just launched the uh, partnership for a strong and inclusive supply chain, uh, so-called RICE, based on the outcome of the G7 Hiroshima Summit. By utilizing this scheme, we would like to promote sustainable development through diversification and high value adding of industries in resource-rich countries. At the recent summit, many resource-rich countries and private companies pointed out the importance of obtaining social license and trust from local residents and the long-term stability of resource-rich countries' governmental policies in order to ensure sustainable development and the diversification of supply in resource-rich countries. In today's webinar, I hope to have a, a frank Ex uh, exchange of views on the experience of private companies and the financial institutions and the uh, uh, challenges they face in pursuit of the common goal of uh, supply diversification. Thank you very much. I hope you, you have a good discussion today. Thank you for your support on this webinar. And then now the, I'd like to invite the panelist speakers to give some opening presentation or verbal intervention. So I'd like to invite Mark from Rio Tinto first. So Rio Tinto is rapidly expanding into the energy transition mineral space. So how Rio Tinto is approaching this the energy transition mineral investment and also how you approach on the circular economy and in terms of partnership. So Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Taeyun, and uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to join this panel. Um, if, if you can move on to the, the first slide, please. To start with, just a, a quick overview of Rio Tinto. Um, we are a 150-year-old diversified miner. We operate in 35 different countries um, where we produce iron ore, copper, aluminium, boron, diamonds, titanium dioxide, and a range of other critical minerals and, and specialty materials for the clean energy transition. The, um, the slide on the screen is specific to our critical minerals um, operations and projects. It includes mines, processing infrastructure, and, and research and development centers. 
Um, it's intended to show that we have a, a global critical minerals footprint across many different minerals and with positions up and down the value chain. Um, this map doesn't capture sort of exploration activities, um, nor the, the many critical minerals that we have in, in potentially recoverable concentrations in ores or waste streams that we don't, don't currently exploit. Next slide, please. So where is Rio Tinto directing our investment to support the global energy transition? Firstly, we're, we're accelerating our own decarbonisation, switching to renewable power, electrifying processing and, and where possible running electric mobile fleets. We estimate that we'll need to spend or will spend seven and a half billion dollars in, in capital between now and 2030 to deliver our decarbonisation strategy, which will see our greenhouse gas emissions reduced by 50% in that time frame. Secondly, we're increasing our investment in R&D to speed up the development of technologies that will enable our customers to decarbonise. So technology and partnerships will have a key role to play. And finally, we're prioritising growth capital in commodities that are essential for the drive to net zero, which is why we established our battery materials business in 2021. And we're focused on finding, producing and refining critical minerals through assets, technology and partnerships. Um, next slide, please. The image on this slide is of scandium, um, a, a critical mineral that is in increasing demand for modern technologies, um, for, for aerospace, for lasers and, and electronics, um, due to its alloying quali qualities and emerging high-tech properties. At our Quebec operations in, in Canada, we have gone within a couple of years from testing a process to then extracting this critical mineral in a lab and to now being able to supply about 20% of the global scandium market. We also combine this scandium with our own low carbon aluminium to produce an alloy that is stronger, more flexible and more resistant to heat and corrosion than would be pure aluminium. So the source of the scandium is waste streams from our titanium dioxide uh, production. So our approach to scandium is therefore illustrative of an alternative approach to the supply of critical minerals, namely via uh, circular economy principles using existing ores, waste streams and processing infrastructure. This approach mitigates a number of problems that are often inherent with the supply of many critical minerals namely high capex and long periods of payback, relatively small and volatile markets for, for some critical minerals and various ESG factors. So not to discount the role of new mines nor the importance of re recycling, supply of critical minerals using the circular economy principles or approach can provide an alternative supply of, of, of critical minerals that is cheap, quick to market, has high ESG credentials and complements other long dated sources of supply, such as via new mines or, or recycling. So in particular, there's an opportunity to use these existing ores and waste streams and processing infrastructure to extract more minerals than we currently do so. So once ores have been extracted and crushed and put into a soluble form, including as waste, it's relatively inexpensive, inexpensive to extract additional minerals. Once permits have been obtained for an existing site, it's usually easier to do other similar activities on that same site without going through new permitting processes. And once processing infrastructure has been built, the marginal cost to extract other minerals using the same infrastructure can be relatively small. And finally, extracting more from existing sites and activities means that we need to open less new mines and produce less waste, which helps with social license. It sounds great in theory, but there are many practical examples. So in addition to scandium, we, we co-produce 3% of the, the global supply of tellurium from waste from our Kennecott copper mine. And we've recently announced a partnership with, with Fortune Minerals to develop technology to recover cobalt and bismuth from, uh, from similar copper ores. It sounds easy, but it's not. It takes a different mindset to think about the wider applications of mining um, or industrial sites. 
Next slide, slide, please. My final point is about the importance of partnerships and technology. Uh, breakthrough technology and science is vital to finding better ways to deliver the materials the world needs with partnerships and collaborations providing pathways for the energy transition. To support technology development, Rio Tinto has research centres in Australia and Canada that we've been operating for more than, uh, more than 50 years. And other partnerships include taking equity positions along the value chain to, to better understand our markets and emerging technologies. Not included on, the, on this slide, but equally important are our partnerships with governments and communities. Um, I will leave it there, but, but very happy to answer, answer any questions during the course of the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It was very interesting to see Rio Tinto is adopting some holistic strategy approach in comparison both investment and technology partnership and also the circular economy aspect. And especially the, the Scandium case is very interesting. So I may invite you to talk more about that, that aspect in the panel discussion sessions. So we now move on to the next speaker, which is assistant, the commodity market analyst, the, the Colleen Hamilton from the BMO capital market. So Colleen is looking at the broad spectrum of the minerals and metals from all the way from base metals to precious metals to battery metals. So Colleen, the welcome, thanks for joining. And then you might share some view about the, how the market would evolve in the coming years and also the, some of the implication of the geopolitical situation in, in the commodity market. So, Colleen, the floor is yours. You can maybe share your screen to the host of presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Can you can you see my screen at the, the current time? I, I think you are on mute. But uh, uh, if you if you can't see my my slides, if you could probably share them from your side, that would be very helpful. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Colin Hamilton. Uh, unfortunately, my video is definitely not working. Um, uh, the uh, I'm going to talk today briefly about what we see in terms of some of these metals, some of the key challenges for the metals and mining industry on the whole. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. So um, if we move to the next slide, please. I mean, BMO, very briefly, um, uh, we are a um, large uh, North American-based investment bank. We are um, pretty big in metals and mining. That's what we do globally. We host the uh, world's largest global metals mining conference. We'll hold our 33rd one of those next February. Uh, very proud of the, the work we do there. But if we move to the next slide, get, let's get on to the key thing around critical minerals. It's interesting. So for uh, commodity analysis, we're used to things moving slowly. We're used to, um, if we have the next slide, please, uh, Eric, if that's okay, thank you. Um, so in, in commodity analysis, we're used to think things moving quite slowly. We, we use steel and copper for many of the same things that we have done for the past 100 years. Now we're being faced with an environment where the fuel to materials transition is accelerating change. And we're not used to technological change in, in metals and mining. And it's a hard thing to adapt to. So the question I get a lot is, well, what metals will we need for this transition? And essentially, the answer is all of them, to certain degrees. Uh, just look at the left-hand side there. I mean, that is the energy tr transition demand delta for some of the key uh, metals that we may look at. So we'll focus a little bit later on some of the more niche ones. But for copper, we see, I mean, 10% of uh, total demand at the current time coming from, uh, come from the energy transition in, in 2030. We're seeing strong growth in areas like aluminium and indeed in nickel. So these are well-established markets. But we're starting to see, uh, on an unconstrained basis, strong demand growth coming through. And that does naturally put strain on the supply side of the industry. But then if we look at that right-hand side, and I borrowed the IEA's data here. Um, so Mark, Mark talked nicely about the battery side. If we look at things like the power generation side, now, um, no matter where we are in the world, we're moving to an environment where we are looking to, for more energy independence. We are looking for a low-carbon future. And as we move towards solar and wind, these are naturally much more metals intensive than the fossil fuel based plant incumbents that we have seen before. And this is a global phenomenon. So we've gone from a situation in metals and mining markets where honestly, China property has been the key driver for much of the past 20 years. 
Now we are moving to a global thematic uh, and that is involving a lot more materials. If we move to the next slide, please, Eric. Now, when we talk crystal minerals and we talk metals generally, you can't avoid China. Um, China's 50% of global copper output, 50% of refined, 58% uh, refined aluminium output. But then if we look at these critical metals, well, in many cases, China's even larger. Um, we get to the case of, of gallium there, over 90% of refined gallium comes from China. So naturally, policies, if you want, are dictated around the vulnerabilities we have from a single supplier being so important. What I did want to highlight in this slide, though, is that those vulnerabilities actually go further back up the supply chains. If we look there at, uh, if we consider how China gets the raw material for this high refined metal output, well, there's a lot of very concentrated dependencies on the ore side. Um, that's 2022. If we look at it, China got um, about 100% of uh, cobalt from the DRC. Now, that is being diversified a little bit. We're seeing more coming from Indonesia now. But there's high dependency there on, on Philippines, on South Africa, and the tin side in Myanmar. And we've seen disruption to that trade flow this year. So the vulnerabilities in these critical mineral chains are not just on the, the China refined side, it's actually upstream as well. And that's where we, I mean, for, for, uh, for wider global benefit, we need to start diversifying that risk. Just to give you an example of something that's on there that, that people may not think about. Magnesium, uh, second bottom on the left-hand chart. So 87% of that coming from China, a lot of it coming from just one province in China. So when we had the energy crisis in the end of 2021, uh, uh, we actually saw supply of magnesium fall quite dramatically. And that just shows the vulnerabilities, that the price basically spiked to 50% in very short order. This is the sort of thing we're trying to alleviate because it makes it very hard to plan. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please, Eric. Now, the global mining industry it's very different to how it used to be. It used to be that uh, in metals and mining, make money, put more money back into the ground. Now, global mining expansion capex used to be 20 to 25% of EBITDA generated by the, the sector as a whole. That's now running more like 10%. A lot more money going back to shareholders, a lot less going into the ground. Now, if you look at the left-hand chart there, it is global mining expansion capex. It's starting to pick up, but it's still very hesitant. Um, it's never been harder to build a mine. And it's very hard for boards who have been penalized in the past and management teams to make that decision to go and put money back in the ground again. And that, uh, with that, we're starting to see some pickup in overall spending, but that's more generated by inflation. On a like-for-like -like basis, that's hardly a pickup at all. I would also say, if we look at that right-hand side, we're not seeing the prompts that you might need. Um, spot prices today uh, for many of the, the, the materials we would consider as critical to the, the fuel to materials transition are lower than they were at this time last year and also below our long run price. So this is a pro-cyclical industry. And in that type of situation, people are not going to make decisions to invest in new assets. So we're not getting the typical supply response that you might need in order to solve the potential problem that we have in the future. And bear in mind, commodity prices are not forward looking. They always price the market of today. And today's market has enough supply. Now I did highlight, put one on there, uranium. That is one where we have seen a lot of interest come through. And now we're getting spot prices to the level that will uh, justify some investment. And uh, obviously, as we see things like small modular reactors come through, that will be part of the, the potential solution. So commodity prices can get there, but at the moment, they're not showing the signals necessary to get investment. Um, uh, can we have the next slide, please, Eric? Now, geopolitics is very interesting. I mean, we're moving to a well, world we've talked about and, and, and commodities and critical minerals at the forefront of this, where we are segmenting the world to a certain extent. Um, and I've just put up on the left-hand side there, and, and this is not making any judgment, just saying, well, what proportion of our commodity supply comes from, let's say, China and Russia uh, and the developed world, and, and then you have the middle, uh, the middle ground. 
where potentially, if you want to call it, it, it is the battlefield. And securing raw material supply becomes very important. Now, what I think is very interesting as we segment these value chains, traceability is very important for critical minerals. Low carbon performance is, is, is critically important for everything we're trying to achieve uh, from a global standpoint. I see a potential where we will move towards more qualification rather than, let's say, a premium. We, we know there's going to be a cost, but I put up the example there of the copper mark on the right-hand side. The copper mark is a, a third-party audited um, uh, reference for the copper industry to say, look, as a consumer, you can trust this material. This is best practice material from a traceability, from a social governance standpoint, and from a carbon standpoint. And I think as we head towards a more segmented world, this is the type of policy we might need to see from a consumer standpoint in order to get uh, more traction through critical minerals chains more generally and solve some of the problems we're looking at. And then just the uh, next slide, please, Eric. Um, that's gone back one, if we go forward, <laughs> sorry. Just my last slide here. And this last slide, uh, We've talked a lot about the supply side here. Now, supply is obviously what we look to for in the mining industry to react. And, and in the field to materials transition, we know we will need more supply. But I'm painting the picture here that we are not going to solve the problem with the supply side. We've kind of missed that challenge in many, in many cases. I simply cannot get enough mine supply to solve the problem in 2030 based on what's been approved already. So then you have to say, well, if the supply side can't do it, what else can we do? And you have to look at the demand side. Uh, so what you, I think we'll see more and more is markets will actually start to design out. We're great engineers in the world. We'll start to design around problems. I've just used the prime example here of copper. And now copper is one, let's say, various, everyone knows, everyone knows about the copper industry. But it's one where we're likely to have to see more substitution in order to meet the needs. So uh, we see potential for use for aluminium in, in various areas. We're starting to see uh, air conditioner manufacturers do that already. It's an inferior product, but if needs must, you can use it and you can design around. And I also highlight there we put up uh, thrifting. So in things like electric vehicles, well, the first electric vehicles were proof of concept. They were naturally over-engineered. We see potential there to, to actually thrift out some material, use a little bit less per vehicle, and that can also help solve the problem. So we, we focus a lot on the supply side. I think there will be demand side adjustments, and I also think circular economy behavior, uh, as we use that more and more, will take that capital stock that we have in place for me uh, metals. And this is the one thing about metals relative to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels you use once and you use up. Metals you can, of course, use again. And I think uh, both the finance industry and indeed the OEMs and manufacturing, as people look to manage their scope threes, will push circular economy behavior a lot more. And we will see scrap become much more strategic. Bear in mind that scrap is the one thing that the developed world is long of. I will stop there, uh, pass on to the next presenter, but I look forward to taking your questions uh, later on. Thank you. Well, thank you, Colin. That's very interesting to see that the the supply may not be able to bear all the burdens, so you need, we need to some holistic approach in compassion for supply and technology innovation and recyclability. But just maybe one clarifying question from our side about this slide on the, the left chart. And it's very interesting that the in terms of the when the market is become tightening, then some kind of demand rationing and demand sacrification, sacrification might be happening, but then the question is, everybody's asking questions about which sector might sacrifice demand and which sector might maintain some robust, resilient demand. So this chart, in a way, you try to quantify the, that picture. So how, how did you, what kind of information indicator did you use to draw that chart about this potential substitution on the x-axis? Yeah, so so obviously we, we did a bit of work to, and, and there's data available for the breakdown of copper end use. We then did a bit of a desk review on that, and then we spoke to people involved. So for commercial air conditioners, we spoke to Dakin, a Japanese air conditioner manufacturer, um, to say, are you thinking about it? They said, yes, we, we, we're looking to switch 50% of our domestic market commercial air conditioners into aluminium tubing. So, uh, I mean, it is, again, talking to the industry. Now, 
Uh, where can you substitute? Um, you can substitute copper for aluminium where there's no space constraint because aluminium, uh, both the thermal and electrical conductivity is lower per cross-sectional area. So you would need bigger uh, bounds. So, um, uh, for example, you, you can see a big circle there as a distribution network. Uh, you can use aluminium alloy wiring in, in distribution, but it does come with its own problems. You need certain engineering skills, uh, electrical engineer skills, to be able to use that in installations. You, uh, it, you need certain fire resistance uh, uh, qualifications. So it, nothing is easy. But what we've seen in the past is that commodity markets tend to find a solution. Uh, we, I, I get frustrated when I see um, big deficits projected in markets. That does not happen. You have to be smarter than that. We all have to be smarter than that and think about solutions. And substitution and thrifting is a key part of the solution. Thank you, Colin. It's very interesting. So now we can move on to the next speaker, the Michael from the HSBC. So as an active investor in this space, and where do you see some, some market opportunities in the coming years? And also, what kind of risks you see, the, what kind of risk factors you consider when making investment decisions? So, Michael, so thanks for joining, and then please share your, some, some of your insights. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Mark and Colin, for, for, for the interesting presentations. Unfortunately, I, I don't have any slides, but... Um, uh, I, I think you'll find this will be controversial and, and it should prompt um, quite a few questions. Um, so, so maybe an introduction. So um, uh, HSBC is the biggest capital provider to the mining and metals sector globally, um, about 25 uh, billion with about 960 clients uh, globally. And, and we do things like IPOs in Indonesia. We do project finance in Argentina. We uh, put together JVs in Saudi. We do M and A in Australia. Um, so we we see we see um, this industry from all sides. Um, and and just full disclosure, I, I lived in Japan um, at high school. I lived in Beijing at uh, university. I've lived in Hong Kong and Singapore for a long time. And I'm I'm from Australia uh, or originally. So I I can also see all uh, all sides to the argument. Um, and so firstly, let's look at transition. So transition, you know, is not a one or two or ten billion dollar problem. It's tens of trillions of dollars across huge industries that have been doing the same thing for hundreds or a hundred years. So this is not something that governments are going to solve with their own capital. This is going to be something that has to be solved by private capital. It's it's too big to be solved by one one country, one market, one one region or, or government. So so the policy incentives are absolutely critical to then determining where that private capital gets spent. So that's number one. Number two, I mean, most of the expansionary capital, and, and Colin, um, maybe we can come back to you later, but um, I, I would assume, number one, getting that expansionary capex number is very, very difficult because a bigger proportion of that number now is from developing countries, and a lot of that is private capital, not listed. You know what Rio and BHP and the big Western miners do is not really that relevant for for transition outside of copper, and and you know that's obviously pretty controversial. But um, let's explore the data a little bit more, and then you've got the geopolitics, and and yes, you know China is is very dominant in in many critical metals, but thank goodness they've invested that capital because without that capital, we wouldn't have those critical metals. Now and we wouldn't have the transition that we that we have. You know, we wouldn't have the EV penetration that we have. We wouldn't have the battery um, manufacturing capacity. So it's it's really important that it, that that has been spent, and I and I think that's worth noting. And then you have the ESG problems with China, and and you know I, th I think it's wrong to classify everything that China does as an ESG problem. I mean, a lot of the new capacity that that is being built is very sensitive to the West's demands on, on ESG. I mean, you look at a lot of the new nickel capacity in, in Indonesia, it's hydro, it's uh, it's solar, it's gas, it's it's not necessarily coal-fired. Um, and thank goodness they've invested $35 billion over the last five years in Indonesia for nickel supply. Otherwise, there's no way we would have the EVs that we have now. So the, the, the real question is, well, why is China so dominant? You know, it's 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 not just necessarily government policy that's driven that. It's it, there's a deeper issue at play here. There's a reason why 
the major miners in Western countries are not the big investors in, in critical metals. There's a reason why most of the processing capacity is not built in Australia or the US or, you know, UK or, or even Japan anymore. Um, and, and I don't think we, we talk about it enough. Um, and the reason is cost of capital. So let's look at cost of equity between developed markets and developing markets. And consistently over the last 10 years, if you take the metals and mining sector, you take like for like companies, developing markets that Saudi, Indonesia, India, China have a 40% advantage in cost of equity. Now, if you think about how important that cost of equity is, if, you, if you're Rio Tinto and you trade at five, four or five times one year forward um, cash flow, what are you going to do? Are you going to invest in a 10-year greenfield project or are you going to invest in processing technology with the returns uncertain? Or are you going to buy back shares at a certain four or five times cash flow? You're going to buy back shares every single time. You don't have the cost of equity to take a risk. You compare you know, a sister company to um, uh, to Rio, and I'm not singling out Rio, I'm, it, it's Western metals and mining companies in general. If we then look at, you know, a, a, a Chinese miner, let's say Zijin, which trades on, let's say, nine or 10 times cash flow, well, at that cost of equity, you can risk that capital, some capital, in terms of greenfield expansion. You can, you can risk that capital in terms of processing technology, right? So the cost of equity is critical to, to determining how much risk and how much new capacity you can build. And you ask, why is, why is the cost of capital so different? Um, and, and it's really interesting because there's no simple answer. To, well, there is a simple answer, but I don't think many people are talking about it. If you look at Western capital markets, it's 85% institutional. Half of that is indexed. The other half is active. But you think of what a fund manager does. They're trying to match their future obli cash flow ob obligations, which are pensions, with a portfolio of current investments. They don't want huge upside. They certainly don't want huge downside. They don't want volatility. They want consistency. And the one thing mining and commodity, commodity markets don't have is consistency. You have huge commodity price variation. And you have greenfield risk which you know may or may not turn into to value w when you finished it you know the capex that you spend it might be two billion it might might end up being four billion it's very hard for western listed companies to absorb that risk now if you compare that to emerging markets china is 80 percent retail that means mums and dads investors not funds um indonesia is 65 percent retail india is 60 percent retail saudi is 55 percent retail you think about when you when you invest in a in a share, you know you actually like that volatility. You want it to be volatile to trade it. You want greenfield expansionary risk to create value in the long term. It's how Western markets used to be thirty years ago. So, in in my mind, that is the absolute core problem with why the West cannot build new capacity and why, in its current form, it's going to be very very difficult to diversify the supply chain. Um, it, it, so that's that's one part of it. The second part of it is is government subsidies. So so let's look at what Saudi is doing at the moment. Saudi is, um, if, if you invest in industrial plant in Saudi at the moment, you'll get 75% leverage at a very low coupon from, from state banks and you'll get a five year tax holiday. If you do the same thing in a Western country, you won't get anything like that. And, and it massively impacts the end return that you get on that investment. And that is one of the reasons. And that, so that's similar to the, the subsidies that, that China you know, has done over the years, but it's also similar to what Japan does. It's similar to what Korea does. It's similar to what Indonesia does. That's why the industrial capacity is being built there. Um, you know, so you have those two, two things in play. Now, you know, one of the questions I used to ask myself is, well, why, why do Western markets invest so much in, in technology, software, for example? You know, that's risky as well. Well, because a, a small investment in technology has potentially a huge payoff. In mining and processing, it's the opposite. A huge investment in mining or processing may, may end up with an economic return on capital. It may. You, you don't know. 
um, but you have to make a huge investment up front. So it's a very different risk proposition for a Western um, capital market participant. So I'll, I'll just finish with what we should be doing. You know, okay, if, if that's the foundation and that's the core problem, how do you solve it? And I think um, government incentives is is one. So governments, Western governments, should be looking at how to incentivize private capital to be invested onshore, and they should not just look at that capital in terms of processing, but why don't we take the Saudi example and do that in mining upstream investment as well? Because something like that is going to have to be done. The second thing is partnership. So, you know, Mark talked about Rio's partnerships. I mean, like it or not, the Chinese companies in processing have the best technology, and, and we should be using that all, all around the world to reduce the cost of increasing supply of critical metals to, to then increase the velocity of transition. Um, and the third thing is, and this is, this is an open question, eventually the con consumer has to pay for ESG for, for certain standards. Um, not, not suggesting that, that I, I think the industry is moving very quickly in terms of ESG, um, but there's always room for improvement. You know, the question is, how does the consumer pay and what do they pay? You know, and I look at the iPhone and I look at Nike and big brands like that, okay? You know, they've had problems in the past and they've addressed them to protect their brand reputation. And I think EVs end up being the same thing. Um, and, 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 you know, the question is, how much does the consumer pay? Because they're not paying very much at the moment. If you look at the Tesla 3, where their batteries come from, I mean, no one even really questions that, although they get IRA um, treatment. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I understand there's there's quite a few controversial things in there. I'm happy to take questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Michael. It was very interesting. The especially the you mentioned about this cost of capital issues, and which was very interesting. Also, you laid out some three key aspects we should consider: the, the incentives, partnership, and ESG. It was very interesting. So. We can elaborate that aspect more in the, the panel discussion session. So now we move on to the, the, the final speaker, Ekaterina from IFC. So we cannot overstate the importance of the role of the developed finance institution in <coughs> facilitating the diversified supply. So how IFC is approaching this, the energy transition minerals and how they are working with developing economies in enabling investment. So Ekaterina, the floor is yours. Many thanks and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and yes, I'm a senior investment officer in the metals and mining team at the IFC. Uh, I'm sure you all know that IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank. Uh, so our role is helping bring private investment and private capital into the emerging markets. Um, maybe next slide, please, Eric. And the following one. Yes, so IFC is one of the, uh, and the World Bank in general, is one of the few development finance institutions that have remained consistently focused on the mining sector because we believe that uh, this is important for the energy transition. We also believe this is important for the development of the emerging markets. Uh, mining is one of the uh, largest employers uh, in, in emerging countries. Uh, with direct jobs and the six times multiplier for indirect jobs. So that, that's uh, our role is is dual. It's it, it's the climate uh, and it's also the the shared prosperity on a on a livable planet. Um, so our mining practice uh, is focused mostly on energy transition minerals. We're active in copper, we're active in lithium. Um, we've invested uh, around six billion for for the last decade, and we work in inequity and debt financing. Next slide. Yes, so here are some, some examples uh, from recent deals. So we've done one on lithium recently in uh, in Argentina. We work in Mongolia. We work with uh, um, you know, large mining companies uh, trying to develop projects in, uh, let's say, challenging jurisdictions. Uh, and we also work with smaller players and helping them bring projects out of the ground. Um, next slide. Yeah, so here are, we've listed some of the uh, some of the partners we work with. Uh, you can see Rio here uh, and and 
um, as as I said, we uh, we are t try to be a global solutions provider. Um, so it's not only mining; it's also the things that um, hinder uh, the development of mining projects or of the processing projects. Uh, so we would work on renewable power to mine solutions. We would work on water to mine solutions, uh, on the wastewater use, on the supply chain. We work with communities and trying to improve the social license to operate of our mining projects. And uh, obviously, given our development role, we focus on either and and um, fragile and conflict affected situations where we can bring the maximum value. Next slide. And um, I think this is very timely because uh, Mr. Kanahir mentioned the RISE partnership uh, and we're part of that as well, as long as the, uh, together with the World Bank. Um, so the partnership, as already mentioned, uh, aims to support uh, our client countries to increase their participation in the mineral supply chain and improve the value addition of the mining activities in country. Uh, so that means processing, that means uh, also enabling environment for processing and infrastructure. Uh, and the the purpose of this obviously is not only to increase the uh, the metals supply and diversify the metal supply, uh, but also to support uh, country development uh, through fiscal benefits, through job creation, through human capital growth, through education. Um, so IFC is working with the World Bank to provide guidance on what private sector will require to enable downstream beneficiation in countries. Uh, so that's regulatory environment, that's ESG practices, technical capacity building, etc. And we're very excited to be working on this. Um, I would also mention an initiative that's been active since 2019. It's a climate smart mining uh, again, jointly with the World Bank, um, we uh, play a role in the sustainability mining space uh, by helping, and, and together with public and private sector partners, and Britain is one of them, um, uh, the purpose of climate smart mining is to help support the sustainable extraction, the processing, the recycling of minerals and metals, uh, while making sure we deliver on social, economic, and environmental benefits. So it's basically a, a knowledge database and a toolbox um, was published uh, in February of this year, the net zero roadmap for copper and nickel value chains. Uh, we've just published uh, last month, the climate mineral explorer that currently focuses on lithium and, and, and graphite, but will be expanded. Um, we published work on, on gender impacts in mining, which are quite significant. Uh, so please, please have a look, it's a, it's a very, um, global initiative uh, and and providing a lot of resources for those of you who are interested in this topic. Next slide. And I'll, I'll, I'll end up with a case study of one of our recent projects in Argentina. Uh, so I think we are all aware of the fact that Argentina at the moment is not the easiest uh, investment proposition uh, because of the um, geopolitical, um, well, not geopolitical risks, but uh, let, let's say the, the, the country context and the, the inflation context. Um, but IFC uh, sees its role uh, as key in country. We believe in the country, we're present in, on the ground, uh, and we work with different country, uh, companies in Argentina. And so Saldavida is our camp's project um, for lithium. Um, it's uh, it's in Catamarca, so it's 4,000 meters above sea level. Uh, I'm sure you can imagine the difficulty that this represents uh, in terms of technical solutions needed, even the even the workforce uh, for for this project. Um, and we've um, we've recently uh, announced the 180 million loan um, for for this project, uh, which is structured as the uh, green uh, and sustainable loan uh, because it's also linked to KPI uh, reducing GHG emissions uh, and uh, gender KPIs. So the, the loan will not only contribute to the um, improvement of lithium availability uh, for the energy transition, but also to the development of the region uh, of the local communities um, and um, 
and, and the reduction of global emissions. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Please let me know what questions you have. I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ekaterina. It was very interesting also to hear about exact real life examples when you invested in, in Argentina. So there's many lessons we can draw from such experience. So we now move on to the, the panel discussion session. I invite all speakers to the, come to the floor. So the, for audience, if you have some questions and for the, the speakers, then please put that in the in, in Q and A chat in Zoom, and then we will pick those questions as to the panelists. And then the I will ask questions to each of the, the speakers, but if feel free to chip in to other questions because we want more dynamic and vibrant discussions. So maybe the first question I may invite Michael to come back to the stage. And so you mentioned about this the the cost of capital issues and also the difficulties in tracking the investment levels in the in the, the mineral metal space. So in maybe if we go some more granular by commodity and by value chain, where you see some some urgent need to scale investment from a long term perspective. Which commodity you see some the biggest the challenges they face in attracting investment. And also maybe you can touch upon the, the third point you mentioned about ESG aspect. So there are some, how the consumers can reward the high ESG performance in the marketplace. So what, what kind of possible mechanisms for that? And also there are questions from the audience about the, the what about some, some pressure or some the requirement for the, the producers industry step through the due diligence requirement or some sustainability standard practices. So the, you can elaborate on your so ESG point a little bit more in, in this, Discussion. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, so commodities. Um, there's there's two different lenses to look at that. I mean, one in total. Um, you know, what's the uh, what, what's the volume of commodities we need, and, and what's the supply? And I'll, I'll defer to Colin with that. But and then, and then the second one is, what supply do we need from um, outside of China to diversify the supply chain. So I think there's two separate questions. I think in terms of need for raw commodity from anywhere, I think lithium is the one, and, and by lithium I mean um, processed battery grade lithium, um, so which includes um, a number of steps in processing. So getting the volume of lithium to where we need to over the next 10 years is going to be really challenging, no matter what um, technology we look at in terms of um, uh, uh, battery storage or, or EVs. I mean, lithium, it looks like becoming even more important to um, uh, battery chemistry over the next few years than it has been in the past. So that, that would be one. I think copper is the other one that um, you know, is is a little bit misunderstood. I mean, everyone realizes that we need copper, and there's going to be a deficit, and and that's you know, that's the most trotted out line in 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 metals and mining. And you can substitute it, yes, but but gee, with with cheap copper, you can transition a lot faster because it's a very useful material in a lot of different ways. Um, so I think they're the two um, commodities, um, and then diversifying the supply chain. Well, that's that's a completely different question. So, so you know, rare earths is obviously um, pretty critical. You know, nickel is is critical, but you know, let's take nickel for example. So, I mean, the the volume and now cost of refined nickel coming out of Indonesia, which is mostly um, China funded, is absolutely enormous. Um, you know, th this year they'll produce one point five. Uh, million tons of contained nickel. You know, Australia produces 160,000 tons of nickel. North America produces 180,000 tons of nickel. That 1.5 coming from Indonesia probably goes to 3 million tons of contained nickel in the next four years. You know, the Western supply in the context of that volume is irrelevant. And so, you know, it's it, it, it's it, if you want to diversify the supply chain, it's a huge, huge task. Um, so that's that's one. ESG and you know let's let's look at how nickel was 
in a process in, in Indonesia five years ago. You, you um, it, it went through a very, very carbon intensive um, process that the mines were not regulated in terms of um, operations. Um, a lot of the tailings went into the sea. Uh, there were effectively no regulations or very little. Now you have um, you have a number of JVs using Chinese technology with Western car manufacturers as investors with Western banks effectively auditing the ESG trail on behalf of the investors. And, you know, many of them are not coal-fired, um, the carbon footprint is much lower. The tailings are managed in a very responsible way as far as they can be. The technology is improving, so it's, it's much more efficient um, in many ways. And the mine operations are, are increasingly regulated um, by government and, and you know, international agencies. Um, so it's, it's improved a lot. And I think you know, it's, it's, it's worth reflecting on that, that not all Chinese volume or Indonesian nickel is bad. You know, it's it's absolutely crucial to um to aid transition. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. That is very interesting. Also, some caution about very simplistic approach about ESG is also well noted. So I'm I'm not sure whether Colin is still with us. Colin, are you here? I think Colin has a connection problem. Oh, yeah. uh, so that then that's... maybe I can invite Mark to the stage. So you, in your presentation, you mentioned about this very interesting project about the recovering the scandium from the, the mine waste. So maybe how economically viable or technologically advanced the uh, such project? And, and is there any scope that government can help to make that project, such project more viable? And also from the, the Q&A box, there are some questions about the your regeneration initiatives, what is potential law for those initiatives? So, Mark, over to you. Thanks, Taeyun. Um, I can start with the, the question from the audience um, uh, around the, the regeneration um, partnership that we have. So, re regeneration is an, is an international restoration and, and remining social enterprise. Um, it was launched by um, an entity called Resolve. Um, with backing from Rio Tinto and Apple and, and others. Um, and it seeks to convert mine waste into responsible minerals and, and turn degraded lands into ecological and, um, and community assets. Um, so I, I think the potential for this type, type of initiative is, is very high. Um, and it also goes to the, the points that have been made earlier around the importance of, of partnerships. Um, in terms of the viability of supplying minerals via a, a circular economy approach, um, so just to reiterate, I mean, supply using a circular economy approach is not going to replace the need for new mines and, and for recycling, um, both of which Rio Tinto is also pursuing. Um, rather, it does need to be part of a, a multifaceted and, and coordinated solution um, to, to the supply of critical minerals. And, uh, and it can be particularly helpful in bringing on supply in the short term, whereas new mines and, and recycling both have, have longer time horizons. In terms of what could be done to facilitate such supply, um, firstly, I think recognize the, this potential source of supply and be, be interested in the broader set of minerals that might be present in an, an ore body or a waste stream. Um, there's also an opportunity to, to map potential sources of additional minerals. So a, a good example of this is the, the Atlas of Australian Mine Waste, um, which, which provides information or is a source of information about Australian mine tailings, waste rock, smelter residues and, and related uh, mine waste materials. Uh, another area for policy consideration is, is around environmental liabilities. So there can be circumstances where small players are, are well positioned uh, to come in towards the end of a life of mine and, and process the remaining ores or waste material, which, which supplies more critical minerals, it, it provides additional employment and taxes, and can, can also help fund remediation activities. Um, the issue is some some closure regulations can impose full liability for all current and historic activities at a site, 
which can deter some of these small players from from undertaking some of this work. So get, getting the balance right um, in this space um, is difficult, but but certainly worth looking at. And then I'd say finally, governments and other stakeholders can also promote good work that's happening in this space um, to educate and in, encourage others, um, as well as to support the the license to operate for for these um, these particular activities. Thanks, thank you, Mark. It's very interesting that there are, you laid out some of the actions that government can have in terms of the, the mapping, geological mappings, and the, try to strike some delicate balance between the, the, in terms of environmental liabilities and others. So that's interesting. So I now to go to Ekaterina. So the, you work with many kind of resource holding the developing economies in the world. So, and many of them actually have some ambition to expand beyond the mining value chain to the refining and processing and even the component manufacturing. So in pursuing such ambitions, what kind of challenges do you see in, in that, that, in, in that effort? And also the, how these can, challenges can be addressed effectively and what is the IFC goal approach in helping this kind of effort? Yes, uh, thank you, Dayun. Uh, that, that's that's a good question, um, and I think the, the challenges are multiple. The first one is um, infrastructure, uh, and it's the lack of infrastructure, basically, because um, what you need for for processing, what you need is is energy, and sometimes that is just not available, or or not at the right uh, prices, or not with the right sources. Um, so we work um, and we, we see this as part of our role. Obviously, it's not just mining. It's, as I mentioned, it's the global infrastructure sur surrounding the mining projects. Um, so we work, uh, we have a large renewable energy practice, for instance, uh, where we can work on power to mine solutions, renewable to mines. And, and the processing uh, facilities as well. Um, so we um, we work with energy companies and um, try to see how, because obviously you cannot stop a mining operation or a processing operation, right? You need a constant supply of energy. So it's not as simple as, you know, can be for other sectors. And also sometimes frequently the projects are far away, they're not connected to the grid. Um, so how do you find those power sources or how do you find uh, less emitting power sources for projects? Um, as, as a recent example, we've um, provided a $400 million loan to NG Chile uh, to decarbonize uh, their grid to switch from fossil fuel-based power generation to renewable power generation through the installation of battery storage facilities. Um, and that benefits directly the mining and metal sectors because the clients uh, of, of NG Chile are mostly metals and mining companies. Um, so this will allow them to decarbonize. This will allow them to get a better supply of energy, uh, a more reliable supply of energy. Uh, and because we're IFC, we've also added some uh, sustainable performance objectives. So there's an, a KPI for reducing the emissions. There are also gender KPIs for that loan. So we try to accompany um, projects and uh, mining, whether it's mining or processing, uh, by allowing infrastructure solutions. It can also be uh, water to mine solutions, desalination. It can be uh, wastewater treatment projects. It can be transport because transport is frequently an issue, rail is frequently an issue. Uh, so we work on that as well. And obviously we're also present in the, in the whole value chain from, from metals to batteries uh, and working under one IFC umbrella to provide solutions um, for, for the countries. And the, the other big challenge is obviously uh, the geopolitical risks. Um, and this is something I've mentioned in my presentation. As a DFI, we can invest in jurisdictions that commercial banks may find difficult um, or for centers that commercial banks may find difficult. Uh, so we help create markets uh, in places where uh, the private sector is um, constrained uh, and uh, by partnering with IFC, private sector can provide finance uh, to projects that would otherwise not be bankable. And thank you, Ekaterina. And alongside many challenges you mentioned and about the kind of availability of, availability of the low emission power sources, electricity is one of the key aspects and also 
the decarbonizing the power grid is also one of the important levels to uh, facilitate the development of the value chain. That's very right, noted. So now I think the, the Colin is back. So welcome back, the Colin. So maybe I invite uh, you thank to you. the screen again. So maybe the question about China. So the China has been playing a very crucial role in driving demand growth for the commodities in the past few decades and also the supply trend. And now the China's economic growth, pace of growth is slowing down. Then the, what role the, can China play in driving this demand growth going forward? And also broadly, some of the, what would be the, you mentioned about, made some important argument about this. The other countries are concerned about security supply, but also China is the also concerned about security supply. So could you also elaborate on that aspect a little bit and then how they might affect the market in, in going forward? Yeah, thanks. So in, in terms of China, um, it's interesting. Uh, energy transition is perhaps the, the first area of global industry where China has this, had the technological lead. And, and as, um, as, as Michael alluded to before, China's made the investment over the past couple of decades to have that technological lead and is now, if you want, using that. Uh, we're like to see Chinese technology exported to a lot of the global south, I would expect, over the, the coming period. So we're just, if we look at it, um, China's installed a ridiculous amount of renewable energy capacity domestically this year. I think that will start to move overseas. I suppose from a geopolitical perspective, what we have seen over the past uh, little while is, is China, if you want, flex its muscles a little bit more in terms of some of the restrictions we're seeing. Now, it's not bans, but restrictions we're seeing on things like gallium and germanium and graphite. Uh, just to say, well, actually, hold on. Uh, if, uh, if, if we are looking at a, a situation where markets are segmenting, look, we, we have... Uh, you need us for the global energy transition and China is going to play a hugely important role in this. If I think about, um, I mean, as I say, if I think about the demand trajectories, it's just, uh, this is, will be global demand rather than just China demand for metals over the next 20 years. But I do still think that the, that the Chinese technology and Chinese companies in many cases uh, will lead the way. Thank you, Colin. So the, Maybe now I invite back the Eka China and then Michael for the next questions. In, in the, the, the Critical Mineral Summit in September, at the IEA, the around 50 ministers and 40 CEOs gathered to discuss about this topic. And then many themes, many topics were discussed, but one of the key theme is about diversifying some midstream refining and processing value chain where the level of concentration is greater. So the in you will be about what are some major challenges in mobilizing finance in this the, the midstream value chain in geographically, geographically diverse regions? And what is find some the good project or less attractive project when you make investment decisions and also the how they can be, that, that challenge can be addressed. So this question, my, I invite Michael and also Ekaterina to, to check in. Maybe Michael first. Uh, I think the answer is economics. Simple as that. I mean, uh, let's look at Europe in terms of, um, you know, the auto industry and let's look at the consumer. You know, are they um, are they not buying Chinese cars because um, they're, they're, they're not ESG friendly or, or some, you know, rhetoric like that? No, they, they're, they're very popular. They're going to be increasingly popular and they're cheap for the quality of product that that people are getting um, now. Ultimately, that's got, that drives the whole supply chain. Um, so, if you want to um, encourage uh, capacity to be built outside of China or even using non-Chinese technologies, you have to make it the product cheap enough and the investment returns high enough to incentivize private capital to to do it. Um, now, the problem with that is um, uh, that the China and, and Chinese technologies have such a scale advantage, even if the technology in, in a Western country is as good or better, the scale that they lack means that the cost of the product is invariably more expensive. And so, you know, who, who pays for that cost 
cost impost? Is that is that going to be the consumer? Is that governments? Um, and is that even a good thing if we're putting a cost impost on something that's you know aiding transition and accelerating transition? So, you know, the, I, I think we we as a global community um, sometimes you know look at China as as um, you know an, an element that we we want to reduce. I mean, in some ways, we should be encouraging partnerships with with Chinese companies, predominantly private companies, to accelerate transition and co-locate um, and co-own a number of the new um, facilities and capacity that comes comes on stream, rather than trying to um, isolate uh, you know Chinese production, which has been hugely beneficial to transition thus far. Thank you, Michael. And <clears throat> the, the same question to Ekaterina, but there's also a question from the audience about the what is being done currently in the world of sustainable finance taxonomies to support this mining and metal investment. So you may touch upon this diversifying midstream processing refining operations and also maybe can talk about some of the your view about the, the about the sustainable the finance taxonomies and relation with the metal mining investment. Yes, thank you. So I think um, Michael raised a number of valid points. Uh, there, are, there are economic reasons why the investment is, is, is reduced. Uh, there are also, um, I would say, reputational reasons. Mining uh, as an industry, uh, I think, is suffering still, uh, and, and unjustifiably so from, from, a, uh, from a reputation that's sometimes a little bit challenging. Um, and then there's less appetite for risk. Uh, put simply, uh, he, investors don't flow to certain uh, geographies, certain riskier projects because they don't have enough of a return. Or, or if speaking about commercial banks, they may not have you know enough limits for that either. Um, so what what IFC does, and obviously that that's our role, is working with uh, investors, working with partners, working with governments. Uh, to unlock private investment in a sustainable and environmentally sound way. Uh, so that's that. That's not easy. That's um, identifying risks, uh, helping uh, the mining projects improve their social license to operate, helping improve their attractiveness. Uh, and also, um, we, we, we have a range of instruments. Uh, we can also provide blended finance solutions, for instance. Uh, we can provide... Um, Free, free advice uh, and support uh, to, to private companies trying to improve the impact of their mining or processing operations. Uh, we are um, our role is helping mining projects and, and processing projects develop in emerging markets, uh, and so we use the array of, of instruments that that we dispose of. And as to sustainability, obviously it's it's a big topic. It's on everyone's lips. Uh, look, I've mentioned the the climate smart mining initiative. Uh, there are many others. Um, it's it's uh, it's a moving uh, landscape, uh, but in which I see is is trying to stay relevant and supportive uh, of um, the initiatives. Uh, that would allow to improve the, the footprint of, of mining and metal operations. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. So then I may invite Mark to come to stage. So because the, we heard from the investors, the IFC and ATFs about their view, about, but from companies' perspective and what kind of the major challenges you face when some seeking some financing for development of this critical mineral project, especially in the diverse regions and, and how, in your view, the can government can help address those challenges. Thanks, Taeyun. Um, so as as I think has been raised by a number of the, the different panelists, there are a number of challenges. Uh, technology remains very dynamic and is, is not yet settled, um, which is both exciting, but it, it can also lead to higher uncertainty and, and greater investment risk. Uh, as we've spoken about, the markets for many critical minerals are, are relatively small and very volatile, um, which um, I think Michael and others have, have mentioned can, can mean that financing for these minerals can be particularly hard to secure. 
another challenge for a company like Rio Tinto is that that we don't look at every project in isolation and it's part of a portfolio of opportunities. Um, and unfortunately, or not surprisingly, there's not unlimited capital. So we need to look at not only does it meet the relevant investment thresholds, but then also how does that stack up, relatively speaking, against other other internal opportunities. There's a there's a few different mitigations um, that can be be undertaken to these these challenges. You can mitigate by diversification across countries and regions, uh, across different minerals, and across different types of partners. Um, this builds resiliency against geopolitical risks. But, but also a, um, against other potential shock events um, back in September, you know, events. You can also application or, or which are not specific to a, a single type of technology. Um, and then as everyone will, um, will know, many governments are becoming more active in their industrial policies um, with increasing opportunities for new partnership and, and new funding. So, for, for example, the government of Canada and the government of Quebec um, will, have been very significant supporters of our, our Scandium and other operations. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. So thank you, Mark. And maybe then my final question to, to Colin. So in your slide, at the last slide, and on the right side, there's some chart about the, the recycling of the share, share of secondary supply across previous commodities. And they all increased from today's level to, to certain levels by 2030. So but one, if you get the past track record, and share of secondary supply has remained relatively stable for most of these industrial metals and, and minerals. So what drives the increase in secondary supply this share? And also how the, the industry and the world can do more to scale up this secondary supply to unlock the more pressure from the circular economy? Sure. So to answer the first question on, on the volume, uh, that is more related to life cycle. I mean, effectively, uh, as an analyst, we have to model scrap as inelastic to a certain extent. Um, and if you think of it, we've consumed a lot of metal in the past 20 years, much more than we did I mean, in the, in the previous 20. So we're getting to the point now where particularly in China, given the, the consumption there, we should be seeing a lot more material come out of first use and then come back as scrap. So it's a function of, of capital stock effectively. And we've been building that capital stock a lot over the past 20 years, and that should allow more, more scrap to come through. In terms of the behavioural change and, and, and maximising that, uh, yes, you can have um, policy-driven uh, support. So um, I suppose pr some of the prime examples are uh, return of, of glass bottles or, or aluminium cans over time and, and, and encouraging the consumer to bring that back into the system. I think if we think a little bit more holistically, um, if we think of things like... Um, uh, goods, if we think of durable and, and, and capital goods, I think these will be leased. And I think the uh, the manufacturer will n start to own them a lot more through life cycle. So they will uh, lease them to the consumer or whether that be a, a manufacturer or, a, or a, an end customer. And we'll bring it, we'll take that back at the end of life cycle to keep it in a, a closed loop. So it means for the, the metals and mining industry, you become more of a material supplier. And you may use some virgin raw materials, but you may also reprocess uh, the scrap that comes out. I mean, uh, and also if I think, if we think of the culture that we have, um, I'm going to use the example of just a simple washing machine. We all, we all, and certainly in the developed world, have access to, to washing machines. The drum in that washing machine never wears out. It can be reused time and time again. So it comes down to design to be able to reuse old bits of equipment. The electronics will wear out. Maybe some of the paneling will wear out, but the actual drum which is a key part of the, the component, can actually be used again. So I think if we move towards more models of leasing where people, as I say, own scope three and own carbon emissions through life cycle, that will actually encourage uh, better behavior. Just the one last thing very quickly I wanted to highlight. The one area where we're not circular at all at the moment is buildings. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, when we build um, real estate, we don't think about how it gets uh, reused. 
there's a lot of efficiencies that can actually be made from a couple of areas. Number one, just designing for deconstruction. Secondly, and maybe this is a little bit more controversial, um, our standards for building are based on the quality of materials that were used 40, 50 years ago when these standards were set up. The quality of the material we produce now, for example, steel, for example, is much higher. You could argue we're building in a lot of inefficiency into our construction from using standards that are outdated. So, uh, I mean, it, it would take a big change, but I think over time that actually reduces the material need. So it's not around the circular behavior. It's just around reducing the material need. So I just think it's something that should be thought about. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. So it's very interesting to get the, the materials that have been consumed in the past decade, especially during the super cycle of commodity demand. And that means that we might expect more scrap coming to the market in the coming years. And then it highlights the importance of the, the putting into system to unlock that, that potential. And also the comment about the role of the material suppliers and also buildings is well, well taken. So now the, we are the, getting some audience questions. So my colleague Eric Wall has been monitoring this the Q and A box very diligently. So maybe Eric, can you pick some good questions and then ask to the one of the panelists? You see. Yes. Um, one of the questions uh, we've received flags um, recent news that some mine suppliers are planning to ask for price premiums for diversified, for a bit more diversified supplies. Um, possibly, uh, you know, one of the advantages would be maybe higher consistency. Uh, and the questions we have is, is, is a price premium for a diversified supply realistic? And also what traceability mechanism would be required or for, for, for prices to diverge on, on that side. Maybe maybe the question would be addressed to, to Michael. Um, difficult question. I mean, it's it's the, the trillion dollar question, you know, um, who pays the premium? Um, how do you measure it? Um, you know, a, a good example is um, aluminium, uh, in, into Europe and the taxonomy there, which is, um, you know, effectively you pay a, a tax on carbon if it's, if it's um, you know, carbon intensive, the production of it, which is a very good way of, um, of doing it. And it's effective, it can be effective in aluminium because of, you know, the certain, certain things with aluminium, um, but in many other commodities, it's very, very hard. I mean, how do you, how do you assess a car coming into, the US, for example, how do you assess a mobile phone? How, how, do, how does that get big enough? And how does the consumer end up paying the uh, the price premium? Um, so I think that's, it, it, it's very, it's very difficult um, to, you know, and, and but it sounds good in theory. So there, there'll be a lot of rhetoric about, you know, green premium yeah. and then a premium for diversified supply. And I think, you know, there will be to some extent, but not enough of a premium to dramatically alter where materials are are produced um, and and mined, in my view. If I can, if I can uh, add to, add to Michael's comments there, I mean the word premium itself is a challenge because you're you're implicitly saying to a consumer you have to pay more, and that is very hard for any consumer to 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 think about. Um, green premiums haven't really worked. I mean there, there has been certain instances where we have seen them be successful for for low carbon material but they haven't become as mainstream as quickly as may have may have been uh, anticipated uh, that's why if we, if we go back to um, what i presented in my slides i did talk about this potential qualification i think it's very hard to say to consumer you have to pay a premium but i do think you can say to consumers you have to source best practice material and that will need traceability uh, to to the point of the question and it will need um, will probably need some third party auditing, as I say, to uh, to make every side confident. Otherwise, you end up uh, tied up in, in in box ticking rather than actually getting a, a practical advantage. So it's a, it's a challenging one, but I do think we might move it towards it more being a qualification rather than a premium. If we think about it, we have uh, ISO standards for for quality for environmental control. So ISO 9001, 14001. These are qualifications, and in, in many value chains, you have to have those qualifications to be able to supply into them. 
this is a prime example where that could actually come in to uh, to critical minerals. Thank you, Colin. This, <coughs> the, the argument about this qualification rather than premium is also very interesting. Then, Eric, do you have another question from the Q&A box or? Yeah, maybe maybe a question to to Mark. Um, so one of the questions points out uh, that companies and governments um, have to be increasing, increasingly confronted uh, with some geopolitical risks. Um, do you have any examples of of good practice out there um, to to deal with those challenges? Yeah, thank thank you for the question. I think we also need to remember that the geopolitical tensions and, and issues of supply chain resiliency are, are not new, um, notwithstanding the, the very significant increase in focus over, over recent years. So a, a good example of this is how Japan has, has sought to secure supplies of minerals to, to support their industrial interests for many decades um, with its state and private bodies working, um, working in tandem. Uh, an example is of that type of investment was um, Japan's uh, investments and interest in Rio Tinto's iron ore operations in the Pilbara in Western Australia over over many decades. And and while the Japanese structuring not, might not be able to be replicated fully in other um, in other jurisdictions or in other contexts, um, there's certainly a lot to be learned from the from the Japanese approach. Um, so I think that's. That's something that people should be mindful of and, and certainly asking questions. Thank you, Mark. Are there any, any questions from the, the Q&A box, Eric? Um, I think we've covered most of the topics that are raised right now. Um, maybe there's a, there's a question on market penetration um, of secondary resources for, for cobalt, lithium, and nickel. And uh, maybe maybe Colin has, has a few few comments on, on that one. Um, so maybe, maybe a few examples on where we are going in terms of secondary resources and how, how that, that can supply the, the market. Um, and so in, uh, specific to um... I suppose the battery materials there, so lithium and cobalt and nickel. Of course, we haven't built the capital stock. So my argument around uh, secondary material, I mean, is that when you built a capital stock. Now, it's interesting. Um, I, I use the example on that slide of lead. Lead is a perfect circular economy. Uh, the auto industry gets 99% of the lead back that it uses in batteries. So um, it's well set up, actually, to be able to get material through. What, of course, we have, though, is, is a couple of challenges on the on the on that secondary material side. Say, no capital stock, but also, quite honestly, the value of secondary materials isn't great at the moment. And if we look at it, I mean, cobalt's the most valuable metal there, but we've seen a, a trend towards thrifting cobalt from these batteries. So, and moving towards lower cobalt technologies, that doesn't help the economics of recycling. I think we will see uh, a lot more reuse, particularly of lithium iron phosphate technology, and things like secondary storage and um, and telecommunication tower backup uh, power sources. Um, I fully believe that we will get to a proper circular economy, but it will take that capital stock to be built and it will take the economies of scale of batteries coming to end the first life before we get that through. Until then, most of the, the recycled material and, and lithium and cobalt will be coming from in-process manufacturing scrap, but that should allow some of these processors to optimize the technologies first. So it's going to be a huge growth area, but it's probably a growth area for the next decade rather than the one for the, the next five years or so. And thank you, Colin. That was very interesting. And then maybe now final question to Ekaterina. So the you presented about this climate smart mining the frame of you in your presentation and then the, also, some roadmap you developed the, to decarbonize nickel and copper operations. So, how those frameworks is incorporated in your investment decisions? In other words, how you take into account those the climate smart mining initiative and also the ESG consideration in your investment decisions? Um, thank you. Um, yes, so the ESG is obviously very important, uh, but then we are not. Um, 
our our goal is not to find you know the perfect net zero mine in a uh, in in a country uh, that you know we, we would that needs support that, that doesn't exist. Um, our goal is to accompany uh, mining and metals clients uh, in helping them secure financing and investment, but also in helping them improve the the footprint uh, of their operation, their social license to operate. Uh, so we work with companies. Uh, we have different teams that can support them on, on on different topics. These are not investment teams. These are internal advisory teams uh, with experts on, on climate, with experts on gender, with experts on community relations, for instance. And we can help uh, mining companies not only to reach compliance um, with equator principles, which is something that you know, everyone is supposed to be doing, uh, but then also if they wish so, uh, to move a little bit beyond the uh, the strict compliance uh, with EPs to, to something more. Uh, and frequently this is very uh, much in line with what the mining companies are also looking for, because they realize that without uh, community support for the project, without uh, in, the improvement of the environmental and emissions footprint uh, for, for, for a new project, uh, without the path to improvement at least, this is going to penalize them, uh, and it's going to penalize the mine, and it's going to penalize the company. So the, we, the clients we work with are very, very understanding of the uh, um, challenges, but also the opportunities that are offered by the uh, um, ESG aspects of the operations. Thank you, Alexander. That's very interesting. So now the time is up. So I'd like to conclude this, today's webinar. So thank you for attending, joining this webinar, for all panelists, and this very illuminating session, and that's excellent. So this webinar will be recorded and also posted on our, on our website and YouTube. And also, the, there will be the second part of the webinar on the 21st of November on the nexus of the, the environmental and social considerations and the Security. So I'd like to invite you to visit the IA website to register for the second part of the webinar. We will set very excellent, great the line of speakers for that session. So thank you again for joining and then the, have a nice evening of today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.